We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and fall break is finally, finally, finally over. Welcome finally. back to college, folks. We're here. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Whenever I hear fall break, I think of college, but no, God, this has been so long. I feel like we had a great season going, summer break, then we had like sprinkle of races here, fall break, now we're going to have like a sprinkle of races, and then before you know it, the season's over. Where has Well, there's also going to be another, there's going to be another big break between Brazil and Qatar too. That's going to be like another three weeks. We, yeah, but anyway, it's race week and- It is race week for- Yeah. For sure. And I'm so excited. It's in my backyard. Am I going? No. Does that make sense? Absolutely not. I'm a little tired from all of my life right now. So you, you, I mean, yeah, we, we (laughs) did, we did kind of tentatively kind of think that we were going to try to go, but it just didn't work out this year. So cross our fingers for next year and we shall see what ends up transpiring. We do definitely want to get to Kota at some point because it's the coolest American track that we have on the calendar. I don't know. Yeah. Jury's still out on Vegas. I don't trust that it actually is real life. Um, but we'll no, see how so- Vegas goes. <laughs> the thing with me though I know this is going to sound so terrible, but like, I don't know if I really want to go to some of the races because you see a car go by so fast and that's all you see. And then you literally sit there and you watch the Sky Sports, like, broadcast, but without sound. So it's like, is no, it there's worth sound. it? There's yeah, sound. but like, yeah, Not the but same. I'm, I'm deaf and I would never hear it. I can't catch all the funnies. And it's like, do I really want to be there or would I rather watch? Like, I would love to go for like free practice and qualifying and then watch the race in the comfort of my own home. That is the camp I live in. I mean, it's a good thought. Obviously we don't know what the actual experience of going to an F1 race is like. So who actually knows what the, what the difference is. Obviously you do get a lot more actually watching on TV in the comfort of your own home in your pajamas at six o'clock in the morning. But I still think that there's some tracks that would be really cool to go to. Fair. Singapore. I'll make the exception for Singapore. (laughs) Singapore. um, I will also make the exception for the stadium section in Mexico. Okay. You got me there. Okay. So I will. Oh, and Monaco. And Monaco. Okay. So we'll go to three races, but that's it. (laughs) Twist my arm. No, but I feel like it's kind of the same as like NBA NFL games are miserable to watch in person. Like they literally do not play. It's better to watch at home. College football, I enjoy in person. MLB, I enjoy in person strictly for the hot dogs and beer, not necessarily the game. Um, But I feel like this would just be the same situation where the product is so much better on TV versus in person for race day. I think quality would be more exciting in person. And because like when the times flash, I think that would be really fun to see. And pre-practice is cool because it doesn't mean anything, but you still get the experience. You still get the sound, but I don't know. I digress. I just It's a good thought. Um, I, as, as somebody who is, is a trained statistician, you know, I have been, you know, broken from watching sports as a normal person, whatever sport it is. Cause I need like a computer in front of me with stats up and all of that fun information. So yeah. So it would be interesting if, if we do go to a F1 race, I will definitely have to have the iPad with me for the data channel, but you know, we'll, we'll see when we get there. <laughs> uh, is it what's the saying like a zebra never changes their stripes or whatever? Yeah, what say yeah, there you I, go. zebra can't there change their stripes. Yeah, yeah. I, I may not be a full time statistician anymore, but I'm still a statistician. And that is one of the things about me. And if you ha- have kind of come on to the podcast, you've just found us. You found us during our, our fall break series. Why don't we reintroduce ourselves real quick before we dive into all the news that we missed over fall break? Yes, I can start. Welcome to the podcast. This is Going Off Track with Emily and Catherine. <laughs> we will go off track and we will hopefully find our way back. But I I can no longer say I'm the Southern Hemisphere co-host. Which that is, is so true. Incredibly sad. So if you if this is your first season with us, I was previously living in Argentina for a work assignment. I'm back in the US now. 
based in Texas. Um, love Formula One. I am the resident Ferrari fan of the podcast for now. We are both jumping on the Williams train. We've loved JV since the beginning. Obviously, my heart is with uh, Franco Colapinto, who's Argentine. And my main man, Carlos Sainz, is moving to Williams. So I think next year I will be the resident Williams fan. We will see. But I got into F1 from my brother, actually. Uh, he was watching Drive to Survive. He's like, oh my gosh, you have to watch it. It's the best like documentary series Netflix has ever done. And I was like, nah, maybe not. And then I watched it and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm obsessed. And then I started watching live seasons like two seasons ago. So still pretty new to the F1 world, but still love it nonetheless. Uh, Catherine and I actually met working in sports. Originally, I have since left. I now have a corporate job. I also have a dog with really long nails that you will continuously hear on the podcast. But yeah, what else do I need to add? I don't know. I think that's it. Not very exciting. Yeah. What about you, Catherine? Um, yeah, I'm Catherine. I am the other half of the podcast. I got into Formula One thanks to a guy that I used to know who I refer to pretty commonly as he who shall not be named. Um Long story that I will never explain, but uh, got into it to in make summer. everyone feel better. I don't know the full story either. So. No, you don't. <laughs> it's a very long story that I could never distill into one podcast episode. So we just don't need to bother with it. But I got into it in 2021 and kind of took one look at the battle between Max Verstappen and Lewis Hamilton and said, I like this. And then dove in head first, binged all of Drive to Survive, which I had actually like turned on once on Netflix prior to actually, you know, the 2021 summer and that season. And I was like, I thought it was something completely different. And I was like, mm, I'm not into this and totally clicked off within like the intro bit. And then I came back to it. It was like, oh, I definitely made a mistake there. So if you like accidentally clicked into Drive to Survive and clicked out, go back in and actually watch it. But I used to work in sports as a sports statistician. Now I am a freelance sports statistician, among other things, and help run this podcast and talk too much about sports because I have opinions and need to inflict them on someone. Yeah, this pretty much was born from Catherine and I not seeing each other for a really long time, then randomly <laughs> running into each other in a mall where I, in a city where I no longer lived in the yeah. line for the Zara dressing <laughs> Changing room. Changing room. <laughs> Um, but then like, it was the algorithm, I swear, you kept like popping up on my Instagram. And like, I found out that you liked F1. I was like, Oh my gosh, I have like, a female friend who likes F1. So I can like talk to her about it. Because it's more fun to talk with females about sports, my personal opinion. Um, and so we just started talking. And then we're like, this could totally be a podcast. And then going off track and board. So. And literally, that is the only thing that we ever talk about in our Instagram DMs. <laughs> and the jo the running joke is we never actually text each other. We only DM each other on Instagram. Which um, is still so yeah. accurate. Yeah. We we <laughs> still, we still do not actually Desperate text. Desperate times, I think we've texted each other like twice, but everything's yes. on Instagram. So. Yes. So um, that is us. That is who we are. Welcome back to the podcast. Welcome to the podcast. Now let's dive into fall break news because... We've had a lot happen over the last three and a half weeks. We have. And it's crazy to have to bring this up on the podcast because it's happened so long ago and we all know about it, but we haven't officially like talked about it. But our favorite, Daniel Ricardo, Danny Rick, has been let go, dropped, taken away his seat. Retired. Um, from Retired from V-Car. I don't fully believe the retirement, though. Let's just put that on pause. But V-Carb slash Red Bull has dropped Daniel Ricciardo for the rest of the season. So Liam Lawson will be taking his seat. And it's assumed that Liam Lawson will also be in the seat going forward into 2025. Because it was kind of in the running between him and Danny. Now that Danny's out of the picture. I mean, they haven't come out and announced it outright, but I don't see who else would be in that seat for next year besides Liam Lawson. Right. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of sad. I'm I'm honestly slightly depressed about it. I, I, I don't love it, but I love less how it came about. I with, do, too. Like, you can understand 
Williams saying, you know, Logan Sargent, sorry, goodbye. And then the next day saying, you know, Franco Colapinto is taking over for his seat. It's Logan Sargent. He was in the sport for a year and a half. He he scored one point in his career. On the and other hand, default. and it was by default a year ago, this, this race actually, because it was Coda 2023 that promoted him. But Danny Ricardo, seven-time race winner, you know, he had a major impact on Formula One. He's one of the reasons why Formula One is so commercially relevant now. And to go into the Singapore weekend where we kind of found out after the fact that Red Bull V-Carb knew that they were going to be parting ways with him after that weekend, and they just, like, nobody said anything, I really think that they should, like, it's it's a weird thing to be like, hey, you're coming into this and you're, you know, we're, we're telling you that this is your swan song. This is your last weekend, which we speculated in our reaction episode. Yeah. But I think that would have been better than to go through the race, to go through the entire song and dance, you know, justify Danny taking the fastest lap point as a, well, if this is his last race, it was the right thing to do. Like the right thing to do, probably would have been to come out and say that this was going to be his last race prior to the beginning of the race weekend. Fine. I accept that opinion, but I still think like the right thing to do would be to let him finish the season. Like he hasn't been racing terribly. The difference that is also and, true. The difference between him and Yuki is not astronomical to the point where it was like Logan Sargent who was causing millions of dollars in damage and not even being able to race because he's damaged his car so poor, so badly. Right. And so, like, that's different than this, especially because, like, the car is not good. The V-carb car is not good. Maybe they already knew. And this goes back to, I think I made this point about someone else. Um, Ollie Behrman. Ollie. Of, like, oh, we know this is who's going to be in the seat going forward, so let's just, like, make the switch and move on. And I think that's what they did. But at the same time, I think he deserves a little bit more respect than what he got. Yeah, I, I really feel like the, the way Red Bull and V-Carb went about it was not the best way. But like you said, this does give Lawson the opportunity to get into the car um, and get re-familiarize with himself with it. Obviously, he drove a few races last year when Danny broke his hand. But it, it the way that it all shook out was not my favorite, even though it's probably the best thing for Lawson to get used to the car in these last six races and then going into 2025. And I also want to add that we have rumblings now that Lawson and Yuki are both being considered for the second Red Bull seat if things continue to go really bad with Perez. But I don't know how much worse they can go with Perez before they actually pull the plug on Perez. But... I still am firmly in the belief that Helmet Marco will never let Yuki Tsunoda drive in the main Red Bull car. So it could very well be. No, but he's going to Aston Martin. We already know that. We already know that. That's our tinfoil hat that he's going to go to Aston Martin, but that's his only hope for like a non Red Bull drive. But I do think that this is. Red Bull Red Bull was auditioning Danny to potentially replace Checo. Now I do think that they are um, auditioning Lawson to potentially replace Checo next year. And if not next year, fine, then like, he'll stay at V Carb. I don't want to. I I personally don't want to see Lawson in a Red Bull car. I don't. I mean, if it's between him and Checo, I'll take him over Checo because obviously, whoa, the all time like defender of Checo is me? now turning on him. Me and saying you want Lawson over Checo. Catherine, I am a I've been saying Checo for, hater. <laughs> I, but I've also been saying for weeks that Red Bull needs to move away from Checo. We thought that was like immediately going to happen after the summer break started. Like, I have, I, I know, don't think honestly, I have been that we went, staunch we of a went, defender. We went from like, oh, Danny's going to replace Checo at the summer break to, oh, Danny's lost his seat and now he's being yeah. replaced by Liam Lawson. My how the turntables, but right, anyways. exactly. So we shall I see. Still, and- I would like to just point this out. I have said from, I think, race number one that Red Bull needs to get its house in order. And I stand by that statement, considering the fact that, like, all of this, there's so many rumblings, there's so much talk. They can't keep Helmet Marco silent. Like, he just keeps talking and won't shut his mouth. Like, Nui's, like, I just think they are running them up no they're a little bit of a hot mess right now but here's here's another thought 
Checo leaves next year, loss into Red Bull. Isaac Hadjar teams up with Yuki Sonoda in the rookie team. I don't know, but see, that is what pisses me off. Like, I would rather see Yuki paired up with Max than Liam Lawson. I know Yuki will never make it to Red Bull, but he's so much more deserving than Lawson is. And that's just like a huge F you to Yuki by doing, I can't. But I, but also, I Yuki into the day I die. I, I don't hate Yuki, don't get me wrong. I think he's great. But we also know that he is attached to V Carb because of Red Bull's relationship with Honda. Like, right, they have leaving. to keep him. Yeah, but they're, they're not leaving, leaving yet. <sighs> and even when they we, do we leave, are, Catherine, we're arguing about something <laughs> in the future. We, we never this talk is a about the present. Podcast only. Who cares about the present? We yeah, only care so, about conspiracy I think theories for twenty twenty five and beyond. To to wrap this up, because we've been talking about this for like I think about ten minutes now. There's a lot of questions up in the air about who is going to be driving at Red Bull and at V Carb in 2025. But Lawson is going to be in the car starting this weekend. And let's talk about Formula One's new major global partner starting let's next talk year. About, I'm going to take points two and four, and then we can circle back to point three because I feel like they yeah, kind of yeah, yeah. go together. Yeah, I agree. So I'm super excited about this. LVMH. If you don't know who or what LVMH is, you're living under a rock. It is one of the biggest congl- like luxury brand co- conglomerates. Even if you um, don't know what LVMH is, you know LVMH brands. You know, yeah. They're a huge, huge group that owns a bunch of luxury brands. Louis Vuitton, um, Moet and Chandon, um, Hennessy. Tag Hauer, Fenty is also a part of this. So, like, it's very, very big, major luxury brands. Um, they are coming to F1 in 2025 as a global partner. So, they signed a 10-year deal with all of these brands. We're speculating Tag Hauer will probably take over for Rolex now that Rolex is leaving F1 as, like, the official timekeeper, which I'm really excited about. I'm I really look forward to see what they do with this global partnership. I'm assuming Louis Vuitton will be doing something. They did really, really cool stuff for the Paris Olympics with like awards and stuff. So I'm sure that that'll roll into F1, the trophies. Exactly. Who knows if the official champagne will change. Um, I don't know if they'd ever move away from the Ferrari champagne. That would actually be something interesting to think about. But it's something to consider. Yes, definitely. So I'm excited to see. Also, Ferrari champagne has nothing to do with Ferrari, the motorsport team. (laughs) They're just the same. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that is a a teeny tiny surprise thing. They're not the same, I promise. Correct. No, but I'm just really excited to see how, like, they integrate all of their brands into F1 with this partnership. I think it'll be really, really cool to see. I yeah. also like love the fashion aspects of this. Kevin and I talk about this in our DMs all the time, but I love like the high end fashion of all of this. So yeah, also love the potential of Rihanna having something to do with this because of Fenty. So yeah, I mean she's she went up to races before though. I know she has. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, ooh, ooh, Fenty partnership with F1 Academy. See, and that's what I think. I think there's going to be an F1 Academy, like, Fenty car. But Please. I don't know if they can, because, like, Charlotte Tilbury has a car. Ooh, and, and they're, like, that's the... too much competition. Ooh, that might be, because I think Charlotte Tilbury is, like, one of, like, is a listed, t- like, main sponsor. Yeah. Things to think about as this unfolds. The more, yeah. We'll, we'll figure it out. And I'm sure more will roll out in, like, February before season starts. Yeah, exactly. But speaking of Rihanna... Watch my transition, Catherine. <laughs> so her boyfriend, partner, I don't I don't think they're Person. engaged or anybody. Her partner, ASAP Rocky, will be co-chairing the Met Gala next year with Lewis Hamilton. So Lewis Hamilton joins Coleman Domingo, ASAP Rocky, Pharrell, Anna Wintour, and this honorary ca- uh, chair that is LeBron James. I'm assuming because it's the middle of the season for yeah. NBA. Yeah. Um, but they're all going to be co-chairs for the Met Gala, which I love the Met Gala. It is my absolute favorite Monday of the year. I think this is like literally the Monday after the Miami Grand Prix as well. 
Yes, it's the first Monday in May, so I'm I'm, I'm pretty sure it is. It usually is right after Miami because a few people have gone. Lewis Hamilton Lewis has went gone last before. year. Not not last year. He went a few years. Was no, he was last, last year? year? Yeah, he's he gone a few the, years the though. Because he bought out like an entire table himself. Because normally it's like really big brands that buy tables, but Lewis Hamilton himself bought a table a few years ago to highlight up and coming um, black, black designers. designers. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, Danny's but he, he was before. he was as a guest last year because you and I talked about his what what he wore on the red carpet. Yes, yeah, he did memories. But yeah, so I'm super excited. The theme is super fine tailoring black style, which is inspired by Monica L. Miller's book Slaves to Fashion: Black Dandyism and the Styling of Black Diasporic Identity. So. I really, I think the theme is really interesting. I also love who they picked as co-chairs for this specific theme. I think they're all very individually and in the aggregate, very fashionable. They take risks. I think what they do with the theme will be really interesting. I'm very excited to see it. I know... Some people are a little on edge about it. It is going to be a harder theme. But Lewis, we've always said, has had the best fashion sense on the grid. I'm really excited to see what he does with this. And I love that he's kind of like branching out and doing other things towards the end of his career. So, Yeah, I, th- I think it's great. Obviously, you know, Lewis Hamilton is, is very, you know, synonymous with style when it comes to, you know, the F1 grid. We ta- There was a, a video that he actually, that was actually released on YouTube where he ranked his like top 10 um, paddock fashions and his th- number one paddock fashion was the open V-neck purple sweater that he <laughs> wore to Monaco this year, which you and I both like, we we like it. We uh, but I just don't understand how he wasn't like dying because it's so because it looks like the itchiest sweater of all time. But I think this is great. I think that this theme will be nailed by some of the guests and completely, absolutely not nailed by other guests. And like, there's going to be a lot of discourse about what everybody comes to the Met Gala wearing. Agreed. I think. The inspiration is like really interesting and I think that it will, I think it'll be a challenge for stylists on wanting to like push the envelope versus being safe to like avoid criticism. But I think if it's pushed like to the right limit, the right level, I think it's going to be, I personally think it's going to be iconic. Like, I haven't loved the last few themes. And right. I really, like, got excited about this theme. Especially the co-chairs, too. Like, yeah. I think, I mean, ASAP Rocky, Coleman Domingo, Pharrell, and Lewis Hamilton, LeBron James, not so much. Those are, like, four incredibly well-styled, well-dressed men. So that's what's really exciting for me. Because some of the co-chairs in the past, I'm like, what are, they have no business being here. So I'm yeah. very excited. Yeah, but, I think it's 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 going to be really good. Um, I'm I'm really excited to see what what Lewis is going to come to the table wearing and of everyone else like I just I love scrolling through like one of my birthday weekend things is always scrolling through Met Gala photos because the Met Gala is either on or like horrifically near my birthday. First Monday in May, I love it. It's my favorite. I think it's May fifth this year. Um, yeah, so the day so yeah. before my birthday. Yeah, very excited, very excited. But all right, well that's so, all I'm something... really excited about this week. <laughs> <laughs> Something that I am excited about, though, and this comes off of the announcement that F1 is going or that going to be teaming up with Lego, is F1 is also going to be teaming up with Mattel to debut a new line of Hot Wheels toys with this new licensing partnership that will have a, you know, specifically like F1 collector Hot Wheels product, but then also will have like the teams. So if you don't want to actually build F1 Legos to have a bunch of you know f1 cars that you can display in your house you can buy the hot wheels range of which i will probably end up doing both because i have very little self-control when it comes to like tiny things and also like the lego stuff is fun i have a lego mclaren formula e car on my coffee table that i got from our uh, austrian grand prix guest host adam when i was recovering from surgery back in the spring so i'm really excited to see what comes uh from this partnership and all of the other global partnerships that we're going to be seeing you know, next year and beyond in Formula One. 
Yeah, I mean, I really, I mean, I think the Hot Wheels and the Legos partnerships make so much sense just pulling in the younger audience. Exactly. Um, like, Drive to Survive gets, like, us and, you know, a little bit younger, a little bit older as well, but really getting the fans involved and, like, excited and interested at a younger age. I mean, granted, we're all going to go out and buy the Legos as well, but it's really, you know, trying to get to that younger audience, I think, which is great. It's super smart, so... Yeah, and and because like there's really not a lot that's specifically for you know younger F1 fans that are like that comes from Formula One itself. I saw like I got those like random Formula One targeted ads, and one of them was this like Ferrari pajama set or like a like a Ferrari onesie for little kids, and it was a hundred and six dollars, and I was like, that's absurd. Well, it's like the six hundred dollars sweatshirt that we keep talking about that I will never right. buy myself. Actually, that's a lie. I'm probably going to buy myself that for Christmas. I say that every year, but yeah. no, it's insane. Some of that stuff is really expensive. So having it be like a lower barrier to entry partnership is, is exactly good. yeah. Well, the Legos and the Hot Wheels probably be a little bit more expensive, but yes, but it'll probably still be a little bit more accessible. Exactly. So that'll be fun. Now to move on to something that is ending in 2025. Um, Renault, who has been a engine supplier to Formula One for 50 years, so about two thirds of the existence of Formula One, is officially ending its engine program after the 2025 season, where they will likely become a Mercedes customer going into the new regulation in 2026. They've had a significant competitive decline decline in their power units since the beginning of the hybrid era in 2014 which is when Mercedes took off and you know went on their their streak of of you know 800 constructors championship wins but they they you know it's it's been rumored pretty much all season that this is happening now it's officially happening they'll have like a monitoring unit i say in heavy quotes it, within you know the Renault organization to kind of maintain knowledge and keep their kind of foot in the door of their skills and you know keeping relevance in the sport but everybody's going to be moving to Alpine Hypertech, which is their motorsport arm that focuses on their endurance program, Formula E, and other rally raid programs for the Renault partner brands. But unsurprisingly, because their power units suck, they will be no longer supplying power units to Formula Yeah, when we talked, I think we talked about on the podcast last year, how Renault was like, and Alpine were kind of jockeying to get more allocated power units than any other right. team just because their power units are suck. really struggling they suck and they go through them much quicker than other teams I think they were trying to get like double the amount of power units each team got a year because they are struggling so as soon as that came out it was inevitable that they were cha- they'd have to change constructors in order to to be competitive or at least stay slightly competitive they're not because they're Alpine but you understand the the sentiment yeah, yeah, yeah. of that well, statement. Like Alpine is a team that probably should be within the realm of like the upper midfield, which they are currently not. Since base and another reason why this is, you know, able to happen instead of Renault just kind of moving into the new regulation and continuing their mediocrity is that Honda is leaving Red Bull as their 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 uh, power unit supplier and is moving to Aston Martin. Aston Martin is currently a Mercedes customer, so that opens up a spot for Mercedes to offer to a different team because you can only be a, a supplier to so many teams on the grid at this point. Yep. Wild. Yeah. Um, but it's Alpine, so we don't really care. Also that, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't mean to, like, shit on them, but I just could care less, so. Right. Okay, so something else I could really care less about, but I still think it's interesting. We still have to talk about it. So Haas came out with, like, this huge announcement of, like, we're becoming partners with Toyota Gazoo Racing. But, like, they're not. <laughs> like, Toyota's not <laughs> coming to F1. It's really them just sharing information for, like, a technical partnership. But Toyota's, like, not actually joining the grid of F1. Yeah, so, I mean, they might have, like, opportunities to share information on how to engineer their cars better. Because Toyota Gazoo Racing is actually a really good program. Like, right. they tend to win a lot in, in the series that they compete in. But it's not good... I don't know how much this is going to do for Haas other than they're probably like getting a few extra dollars for Eugene Haas to not spend on the team. Yeah. I don't know. 
It is what it is. Haas always comes out with like these big crazy things and it's a bunch of nothing burgers. So I'm not right, surprised. exactly. But still, it, you know, because the name Toyota was attached, it became a thing. Exactly. But other thing that I think is interesting, and this came out today, it's Thursday as we record this, is F1 is going to be getting rid of the fastest lap point starting next season. Yeah, I, I honestly don't know how I feel about this. Like, I I think it's an interesting point. I think it also definitely changes strategy for teams. I don't know if it's like a life changing point. Like, has anyone ever won because they got one fastest lap point? Well, we'll see this year. We'll see this year, but okay. So once since 2019, but I still think it's interesting, especially for, cause it affects constructors and drivers. I think it's interesting that we're scrapping it all of a sudden. Like if it's really not that big of a difference either way, why wouldn't you just keep it? You know what I mean? Yeah. I, so it was introduced in 2019 to kind of, is one of those attempts to add more spectacle to the racing, which is something that for, yeah, I, I think it does. I mean, just look at what happened in Singapore. That was a spectacle. And I, but it, it has it, really it really hasn't panned out because it tends to be that the person who gets the fastest lap is also probably the person who's winning the race and for a long time in formula one the person who's winning the race was either lewis hamilton or max verstappen yeah that's fair i didn't realize winston's now making an appearance on the yes podcast. hello <laughs> hello winston it's My so nice to see you <laughs> oh so cute He's on his bed now, so we won't hear his nails. Mm, <laughs> Thank God. Yeah. So that was announced yeah. today by the World Motorsport Council. And I don't know how much of an impact it's going to have, but we'll see. It's I six guess. one way, half dozen the other. It doesn't really matter. I just like, I don't love. Okay. This is where like, I'm not a statistic- statistician, but like, this is the part of F1 that I hate is that they change stuff up so many times and so much that like, you can't take seasons and look at them apples to apples like you have to have like an asterisk if you compare because the stats are different because there's more races in this season than there was this season like granted COVID was a whole different era but like we have what 24 races now we used to not have that many so looking at the wins and the points are different like you can't compare everything so I think it's like they keep trying to change the product and it's like just stop just stop messing with it that's my two cents but yeah no I it's I I don't love it I think that the fastest lap point is kind of something you know fun to to have and I don't know I guess we'll we'll see if it really if if it's something that we really notice not being there come next season so you know Shrug, we'll see. Other things that we're going to be getting next season per the World Motorsport Council is F1 rookies will be getting extra P1 outings. So right now the rule is every team has to give a rookie driver and a rookie driver is a driver who has not started more than two Formula One races. One one practice session per per year per car. So every year a driver has, has to miss one practice session. Now it has moved up to two practice sessions. So Max Verstappen has to miss two FP1s and a rookie driver. And it can be the same rookie driver, you know, each of the four times. So, you know, for, you know, keeping it in the Red Bull family, Isaac Hadjar, um, if he continues to be that rookie driver, can go in for Max Verstappen in his two times, Sergio Perez or whoever's going to be driving that second seat in 2025, those two times. And then also the two V-carb cars, if he's also not um, driving in V-carb. So he could, what's that, eight times in in a season? But yeah, it's... I think this is interesting. We've talked about this like until the cows come home, but like the fact that formula two is not doing enough to actually prepare rookies for formula one. So this is, this feels like one of those things of formula one and the world motorsport council saying we got to do something. Let's give them more FP one sessions. Does FP one really give these rookie drivers the most, you know, indicative, whatever about how it is to be an F one driver? Probably not, but it's not like they're going to replace an F one driver during a race with a rookie. Unless he has appendicitis. (laughs) I mean, here's my take on this. I think it's great that we're getting the more experience, but I feel like it's a case where they've identified a problem and they're trying to put a Band-Aid over it where we need to, like, conduct surgery. You know what I mean? Right. Like, 
okay, great, let's get him a one more race. But truly the root cause of all of this is that F2 is not preparing them adequately for F1. So like, why don't we fix F2? I know it'll be a big undertaking, but I feel like that would help more than being like, here's a one more race and now you're ready for F1. You know what I mean? I think that's stupid. Yeah. And it's not I, even a I race. It's just here's one more practice session. Like, I think the the big thing here is that they are not appropriately addressing the issue. Right, right, exactly. And I think that, you know, it, it's it's still going to the fact that, like, if I'm going to Monaco to watch Formula One race and go through the entire weekend, I'm not going to watch Isaac Hadjar drive for Max Verstappen. I'm going to see Max Verstappen drive, even if it is free practice one, which no one cares about. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, but again, missing one driver for one for two practice sessions, there's what, 24 races on average, there's like two, let's say two practice sessions because of like sprint weekends and stuff. So there's what, 48 sessions and they miss out on two. Like, I think oh, we're in, all in the be okay. It feels like a lot when you say like it has to be, you know, it's two weekends per driver every year, but we do have so many practice sessions and it's not yeah. like... That it's not like every team sits their rookie for every like this for the same practice session yes a lot of them tend to be at certain races like sometimes we have a lot of them in like Abu Dhabi or Qatar or Mexico but they have you know more and more over the this this season maybe also like the last season of putting them in at other races where you wouldn't commonly see it like when we had um one of Red Bull's rookies whose name is escaping me. Um, oh, Ayumu Uwasa drive in Japan because he yep. was a Japanese driver and they just drove him in, in Japan for one of the rookie sessions. So it it really won't be that noticeable of like, uh, you know. It will not change anyone's life. Yeah, there won't be for, four. For them or for us, it really won't. Right, there won't be four races where we're watching, you know, FP1 and it's all rookies. Yeah, but like Kevin, who's watching FP1? I mean, I mean, I will be watching FP1 this weekend because it won't be at two o'clock in the well, morning. Yeah, but like so normally, you're not watching FP1. No, I am not because I am usually sleeping during FP1 because I live in the you know Western United States and Formula One times are not exactly conducive to where I live in Arizona. The audacity. How dare it? All right. We have spent almost 40 minutes talking up on, on the news and things that we've missed over with the winter break, which like fall break we had things, whatever, fall break, winter break, all the same, same shit. But let's jump into this weekend. So we, like we said earlier, we are at COTA or Circuit of the Americas, the United States Grand Prix, however, 27 ways you want to say it. I'm excited. Before we like jump into this year, I just want to remind everyone this is the race where Charles Leclerc and Lewis Hamilton got disqualified last year because of the skid plates. And this is the default point that Logan, Logan Sargent at his one of three home races last year. Yes, yeah, so this is his lone point, but just something yeah. crazy. Also, for you guys who are maybe new to the podcast, haven't heard us in a while talk about this. It's also Sprint Weekend. So Catherine and I loathe Sprint Weekends and we have to talk mm -hmm. about it. Yeah. Um, in the Sprint last season, it is again this season. So Coda 2024. So looking into this weekend, we, and this is like the thing that I find really funny. Whenever they race in the US, it's like, how American can we make our liveries and helmets? Yeah. But I feel like every other country race or whatever, it's not that like hardcore dedicated. China was different. We had the panda helmet. Oh Joe my God, the panda had a really helmet. cool specialty helmet. It's also his home race. But like, I don't know, for other countries, it's not like they go crazy for their the country culture that they're racing in. I just think it's funny how for all of the American races, it's like eagles, stars, stripes, red, white, blue. So, yeah. Anyways. Or or because this is Cota in Texas, it's somebody showing up to the paddock wearing a University of Texas at Austin. Um, Hook them. horns. Basketball or jersey. Or Lewis Hamilton's denim on denim. Denim, denim. With, with leather accents. Love. So good. Yeah. But, Better than Monaco. 
<laughs> yeah, so a few years ago, Danny Ricardo showed up wearing the UT basketball jersey. This year, it was Lando Norris who decided to be the, the University of Texas representative in the paddock. But yeah, it's it's very American, very cowboy. There was um, a video that Alpine posted today of Pierre Gasly saying, howdy, oh y'all, God. which French people with that are like from France with French accents should probably just not say, howdy, y'all. It just didn't work. No, it I'm was pretty funny. sure he was in Allen Boots, too, which is in, like, downtown Austin. But anyways. Yeah. So going off of that theme and our jokes aside, uh, so Haas has an eagle livery this weekend because obviously. America. Why not? I, it's literally not that different. There's, like, an eagle on it, and I think it's so dumb. They didn't need to do this. Yeah, they they splash a little bit of blue on. It's it, yeah. this is their second home race because they are technically an American team because they're based out of North Carolina when they're not in Europe. But yeah, it it really it, I don't think it's going to show on TV broadcasts. No, you won't see it. It's not such that a you're going to see space. the Haas anyway because the Haas doesn't really do much during races. But I don't really think you're going to see much of the the eagle livery. Yeah. So one that I'm like on the fence about is McLaren. So we know that McLaren has a really big partnership with Google. And I feel like there's, I don't know if it's specifically Google. For me, the Google is really like popping now, but it's probably because of the Chrome. So they added more Chrome or they added Chrome to the livery. Not the whole thing, but like half of it, a third, fourth. Um, I think it's better than when they did this last year. I agree. It's not, like, amazing, but we know, you know, McLaren never does an amazing special livery. But I feel like it's more Google. And maybe that's just, like, because it pops more on the Chrome. But it, like, just screamed Google to me. Yeah, it's it's very Google Chrome. Obviously, when we think about their partnership with Google, we think about the the Google Chrome logo on their wheels. Ah, It is time for dinner for Bishop. Check that off your bingo card. Nailed it. Going off track podcast. But it's it's definitely more Google forward than usual, I think. And yeah. it's I I do like this better than when they did this last year at Silverstone. I, I yeah. think it's it's not like a livery that's wowed me, like the V Carb Miami livery, but it's still it's a it's a good alternative livery. I can live with it, and it'll sh- it'll show on the broadcast. Agreed. Yeah. Um. And then we have Alpine, and they did like this weird Indiana Jones livery. I think it's stupid. I don't like it. I think That's they look like a McLaren. Say. I think yeah. they look like a McLaren. They will also be wearing special race suits that look like you know like the longitude and latitude markers that they have on globes that's basically what they have on their race suits all part of the indiana jones collaboration through xbox for the new indiana jones video game that's debuting in december of this year okay i'm not sold i'll have to see it in person in action yeah i they also in like all the promo stuff like it's heavily like orange filtered so it's really difficult to see like what is orange car versus what is orange filter on car so i i really don't know if they actually finished designing the livery before they like put out the social media assets probably not yeah and then on a helmet side i only saw a few when i was looking so there might be more and if there are any ones that stand out we'll talk about them in the reaction episode but oscar piastri has a kind of dual color usa helmet that he will also be wearing in vegas that i actually think looks pretty cool what are you, what are you laughing at? are you laughing at the livery no i'm laughing at myself about oscar piastri's helmet oh no. because okay so it says like highway 81 everywhere on the helmet and i'm like that's so weird because like there is a not a big like freeway but like a big road in austin and like coda is off of the 71 or like Mm. whatever and i'm like they messed it up and i'm like oh wait no his His driver number it like took me five minutes to figure this out i'm like oh my gosh they have a huge mess up on the helmet and like a thousand people had to approve this and like how do they mess this up and I'm like oh my gosh and I'm, I'm like oh, is there a right. highway 81 and then I'm like oh wait no that's his that's his number, number. I yeah I don't know what he messed up 
So, I mean, I, I kind I kind of like it. It's, it's, it's kind of fun as like a, a custom livery, one of the, or not custom livery, custom helmet. The, uh, the other helmet that I saw that I don't love is Sergio Perez's Disney plus ESPN helmet. They just kind of put like the Disney plus logo right on the top, which is like, it's whatever, but I'm it's so tired of Sergio Perez, like trying to make fetch happen, honestly, with his, like between his horrible social media and like the cringeworthy content and like him trying to do something, it always falls flat. You will never get me to say anything positive again about Checo and anything he does. And I know that. It's case in point. It's it's a it's a very meh helmet, but as we do our our season long helmet rundown, it's one that we will have to, you know, discuss anyway. But the other one that I, I actually really love this one is Alex Albon has uh, debuted his throwback to his very first karting helmet in honor of his 100th Grand Prix race this weekend. And I just think it's really fun. And like he just he has the best helmets. He does. Like, on the I love I love the homage to his, you know, karting days. And I love I love when people do something sentimental on their helmet and do I look forward to the hundredth Grand Prix helmets because I think they're super special. Lando I still had think a great Lando's one. is Lando's is the best that's ever done it. But I think um I really like Alex's. So yeah, between his this and the panda, I think uh he wins helmet wearer of the year for me. Yeah, I don't disagree. And we will see if there are any other helmets. There probably will be, you know, maybe, you know, one of the Haas drivers will come out with an American themed helmet because I think they tend to do that. Oh, no, Catherine, they will all have stars and stripes and eagles and, you know, hot dogs and horses and horns. Yeah, like, let's be real. Much. That's America. Okay, so getting more technical here. So upgrades. They've had a long break that unlike the summer break, they can't really work on the car. This fake fall break. They're still in season. They are not banned from working, so you can bring upgrades. So, like, logically, you'd say, oh, wow, we have a really long break. We can really put work into the car. Like, let's do it, right? Well, yeah, that's what every single team did but Ferrari. Yeah, though I do want to add, and I forgot to put this in the rundown, so this is, you know, fully my bad, but Red Bull did announce today that they are not bringing the upgrade package that they had planned to so they advanced they're some though they're not bringing the full package right so they they advanced some of their upgrade package for singapore which helped and then we're gonna bring the rest of them to kota but apparently there were some issues in you know testing back you know at, at home base so they are not gonna bring all of it but they are still bringing more of an upgrade than ferrari which is bringing nothing and i don't think that's a smart move for ferrari well just another case of ferrari being ferrari so yep anyways and it is a sprint weekend so this is our um first sprint since austria yeah which was in june jesus christ i hate how they do this though they it doesn't make sense they cram like all of the sprints into the very back half of the season well, like, so I feel dumb. like they, 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 well, they had back to back in China and Miami. Then you had Austria. Now you have Cota and Brazil. Brazil is, no, is Qatar still a I sprint? Think, I think we have three left. We know. never know how many sprints there are. Because we don't but, care. But they, but they are, they're not spread throughout the, the calendar very well, which, you know, you can't really, there, there are some tracks that are just really not conducive to, to sprint you know, sprints. Um, and I honestly also kind of think Coda is one Prove of them. Me wrong. But Monaco needs to be a sprint. <laughs> but we do, ag- you and I do agree that Monaco should be a sprint race, but we shall see if that actually happens one day. And, you know, Stefano Domenicali probably has to get like really drunk and, you know, to, to agree to that. But he also does really like having the sprints and wants more of them. So maybe he'll be that crazy. Yeah, we'll see. So, okay, this, I do want to caveat my previous, you know, soapbox of why I don't want to go to an F1 race. Um, And I'm just going to add to it of, I think the deciding factor for me of not wanting to be in Austin this weekend was there's a Georgia, Texas football game this weekend. So it's number one versus number five. College game day is going to be there on Saturday the stadium to Cota is like not that far apart. Like it is, but it's not. It's all in Austin. There's literally nowhere to stay. 
It's just a dumpster fire. Also, the 35 has been habitually under construction around the Austin area since I lived there in the early 2000s. So that's disgusting. Like, there's just no positives about being in Austin this weekend. Um, Especially because Saturday's a sprint day. It's not just, like, practice and quality. It's, like, actually a day that matters. It's just going to be Sprint a day and game day at the same time. Yeah, it's oh it's, it's going to be a you, lot That's, like, rough. my worst nightmare. I hate people. Can you imagine me with all of those people in all that traffic? Absolutely not. I, I like people just as much as you do, which is not very much, you know, says the, the hermit. So fully, fully understandable. And, yeah, this was a very interesting scheduling quirk that – ESPN has sort of jumped on in the like, you know, watch Formula One and this biggest game of the year all at the same time in the same place, except they forget that the a major portion of the F1 weekend is the sprint and it's the yeah. same day as the football game. And they're like, ooh, maybe we should not talk about that little conflict. But if you're watching football all day on Saturday, take a little break for a half hour, watch the sprint race, and then you can go back to your football and you probably won't I miss know. much. I just, I wonder if this is going to, like, actually mess anything up. Because, like, at night, that Coda has, like, huge stuff going on, too. And the traffic's just going to be terrible. And, I mean, like, yeah. last the last two weekends have been ACL, which is a huge music festival in Austin. And now it's this and the, oh, my God, I can't. That's, like, my worst nightmare. Yep. Well, fortunately, you're a few hours away and I'm a few hundred miles away. So we will be able to watch yeah. from the comforts of our own homes. We will. All right, well, I have nothing to add about the weekend or the sprint or anything else that's happened. And considering that we're already an hour in, let's get to our predictions. Yeah. Right so we, um, so Catherine and I do predictions normally just for the race, but it's a sprint weekend, so we also do it for that. We do pole, podium, and P10 for the sprint race. We do P8. P8 and P10 are the last places on the grid where you get a point. You get one point for P8 and P10. We give ourselves three because it's actually very, very difficult to predict. Yep. Um, but yeah, so let's uh, get into our prediction. So, Catherine, for your sprint poll, who do you have? That's a great question. Let me pull up my no, my I'm predictions. Up my um, for my sp- – okay, so I'm going to caveat all of this with this was very <laughs> difficult for me because it's been a month since we've raced and we yeah. don't know what the cars are going to look like. Correct. So. I'm going to run on the assumption that all my, my predictions are going to be bad and, and we'll see. But for sprint pole, I am going with Oscar Piastri. Love, 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 love. I have Max. Okay. Okay. Mm, interesting. But for my sprint podium, I yes. have Oscar Max Lando. I also Oscar Max Lando. <laughs> Look at us. Yeah. Okay. And then for P8, who do you have for P8? I went with Alex Albon, actually, which Ooh. is a really weird choice, but that's what I'm going with. And I went with his teammate, Franco Colapinto. Ooh, I like that pick. Ah, let's, you know. let's keep getting I that boy too. more points. It's his first sprint race, so Ooh, I don't know. yeah, I that'll be good. That'll be fun to see how he does in because he he has struggled a little bit with qualifying initially. Obviously, they they both qualified in the top ten last race, but. You know, qualifying when you're, you know, brand new to Formula One is not easy, let alone, you know, diving straight into a, you know, first sprint race. So that could be, that could be something. Yeah. And I also like, this is getting way ahead of ourselves, but I have him like in my mind doing much better in the race, just considering he'll have a sprint under his belt at Coda going into the race on Sunday. So I think he'll be like, I don't have him for P10 on, for the race day because I think he's going to be higher in the points than P10 on okay. race day. I will, I will accept that. But, okay. Um, who is your normal race poll getter? Might be a cop-out, but I went with Oscar again. Okay, I went with Lando. <laughs> Ooh, okay. I don't have anything against Oscar, I promise. But I, I don't know. He always just is in, like, P2 for quality, so... Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it could be. We'll see. Yeah, and then for my podium, I've just mixed up my... my Hi, Winston. His nails. Um, I've mixed up my sprint race podium, so I have um, Lando, Oscar, Max. 
Oh, I also mixed up my spent rice podium. I did not intend to, but it was when you mentioned it, it was like, oh, that's what I did too. But I went Max Oscar Lando. Okay. okay. Yeah. So we'll see. I think this is going to be a pretty pivotal weekend for like the ongoing battle between Max and Lando. Yeah. And also I think that McLaren is really just going to really pull away this weekend with how many points are available. Oh, from, constructors um, wise, definitely. For constructors wise, from from Red Bull. Okay, so yeah. P ten. Who's your P ten? Our last prediction. My P ten. I'm gonna go with Liam Lawson. I think he's gonna. He's a, he. We know oh. how good of a driver he is. So I think yeah, he's gonna, he's gonna come on. Car sucks. Yeah, but I mean, if Yuki can hover in like that range, then I think that Liam can too. You're giving him way too much credit. I might. Um, I have I have Hulkenberg just because I feel like he's a very safe P10. Pick. Honestly, I almost <laughs> went with Hulkenberg, and then I was like, "Wait, this is Lawson's first time out. I'm going to give it to Lawson." Yeah. Okay. And then I'm going to be honest with you. I did not do biggest surprise of who's going to do a dumb because we've been on break for way too long that I just have zero idea. Like anything that'll happen will be a surprise, and I. Like, Everyone can do a dumb. <laughs> I don't disagree. I had a really hard time trying to figure out with a big surprise, but I did say for dumb that I do think that Ferrari's decision to not bring anything upgrade wise is not a great idea. How original, Catherine. <laughs> I know, I know. I, I know I'm really hard on Ferrari. The end of the episode, I have to shit on Ferrari one more time. Before well, obviously. We, before we're done. So, but, but I do think that that's, I, I don't think that was a great idea. I mean, I don't think they think it's a good idea either, but here we are. <laughs> yep. So we'll, we'll see. But yeah, we will resume our biggest surprise what? and who's go- going to what do a dump pick in Mexico. What are doing? Oh my God. Okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll resume that thoughts. in Mexico and we'll see. Final thoughts. I'm super excited to be back on track and back racing. So happy to have a race again. As much as it was like nice and fun and cute to have a break, I'm really happy that we're back. Um, and I love that it's a good race time for us. Yay. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm just really excited to have Formula One back just in general. Cause I've been bored with only watching, you know, football and college volleyball. So, you know, there's that, but yeah, I think this, this is the I, most magical time of the year, Catherine. I just love the fact that I can turn on the TV and there will be a sporting event on whether it's good baseball, hockey, football, or volleyball at basically any time, because on like during like the, like August, September, you know, time of year where you like, ESPN just doesn't have anything good on in the evenings like I get a little stir crazy when we don't have that so this is a great time for like all of the sports to be happening so I always have something to be watching because if I'm not watching sports I'm probably watching a police procedural and I'm probably going a little crazy (laughs) same 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 yeah before we say goodbye Catherine we need to get your fun fact so what is your f1 fun fact for us for this week Okay, so this also might be a little bit of a cop-out, fun fact-wise, but we worked really hard on this, and I worked really hard on this, so I would want you to all to make sure that you have checked out our F1 Team Genealogy series that we did over fall break. We had five episodes. We talked about all 10 teams and kind of how they originated to get to the teams that they are now. We had a wonderful time talking about the long histories of Alpine and Aston Martin, um, and that actually came out a couple of days ago. So if you have not watched those episodes, listen to those episodes you definitely should that because you will get a ton of f1 related fun facts in each of those five episodes and that's like a few hours to get you through your days to you know as as we wait for the race to begin exactly what a way to prom- to self-promote Hi, i do that the best all right so up next for the podcast we will have our cota united states grand prix re- um recap episode that'll be out on most likely monday uh which should be monday should be monday yeah gotta think about the work-life balance right um that'll be out for you guys on monday make sure that you follow us on socials this weekend to hear winston's tippy tappies um Catherine and i will be updating our instagram constantly going dot off dot track uh but yeah that has been our cota prediction episode thanks for going off track with us guys and we nailed it to just hour. under an hour. <laughs> I think I might have to keep that bit in at the very end of the episode and just cut it. I think we that. do. I think yeah. we do. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. If only for the if only for the YouTube. I think it's I think it's a great rock. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. I will do that. 